Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim assalamu alaikum and welcome to tonight's live show on imam hussein tv you may note 2 weeks ago we discussed part 1 of islamic divorce part 1 islamic divorce actually led up to what the hardships are or were that are faced by people undergoing a potential divorce in the future what rights they have or have not had as it were custody battles in the future but also forced marriages. In the second part, which was last week, we discussed what actually entails the divorce process and also what the trials and tribulations are by certain individuals throughout the world. We've been getting absolutely amazing responses. Sweden, Iraq, Bahrain, Sudan as well. We've also had calls and emails from India, Pakistan, South America, as I mentioned last week. And so this week is the third part, part three, to discuss Islamic divorce. What exactly happens on the first day after the divorce? Exactly what under, is undergoing through children? What trials do they face? What are the hardships that individuals face after the divorce? And so with me tonight, we have, I am privileged to have once again with me, Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Um, it's an honor once again to have you on live, as it were, onto this Thank show. Thank you. We've had tremendous responses, as it were, throughout the world. WhatsApp messages, telephone calls, brothers and sisters, as it were. We've been inundated by messages and queries regarding um, your expertise, as it were, on effect with regards to Islamic divorce now. So uh, without further ado, I'm just going to start off as it were, um, with regards to the first question now that's come through. How soon can one get married after a divorce? I mean, what is the criteria for both a man and a woman? It's a very interesting period when all of a sudden you're back to independence mm. again. For some, it's extremely difficult to take. For others, they've waited years to have that independence because they feel that they were in the most difficult relationship for different reasons. Now, in terms of when one is speaking legally, let's say, for example, the marriage has not been consummated, then that person can move on straight away. Okay. And as we know, if the marriage has been consummated, there is a discussion concerning the beginning of the third menstrual cycle, for example, as from that period onwards, when a person can now move on. Yeah. Um, that Idda period mm -hmm. has to be observed. Right. And we stress on this because there are many who, as soon as they get divorced, imagine that that's it. The moment the divorce formula is pronounced, then I can now move on in my life, even move on physically with somebody else. And walk away. Yeah, and what I think many people don't realize is that, no, you, you have to observe that uh, period known as the Idda period, the waiting period. Sure. And that's normally seen for two reasons. Right. The first reason is possible pregnancy. Now, you may have started to plan that I'm going to, you know, this is the end of our marriage and I'm moving on and, you know what, I'm going to build my life again. Yeah. And you find out a couple of months into the Idda period that you're pregnant. In a way, this could, for example, result in a reconciliation. Yes. Maybe now that you are pregnant with this baby, and we know that Islamic law does not allow abortion, except in cases, for example, such as the mother's life being in danger or an unbearable social harm that could even lead to the death of somebody. But when we're looking at this issue, for example, you find that some have reconciled when there has been news of a pregnancy. Yes. 
Now, I know that there are people out there who will say, well, there's no way I'm going to be pregnant. I made sure that I looked after all the measures that were needed mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the contraceptives were taken sure. and the morning after pill and so on. But you never know. And the yeah. reality is that that pregnancy can happen. If that pregnancy happens, then that Idda period may extend to the day the baby is born. Right. Um, then there are, then the understanding of the Idda period also is before you straight away think of moving on, uh -huh. you may in that couple of month period suddenly remember the good times you had with your uh, ex-husband. Absolutely. In reality, there is still this recognition of him being your husband, for example. And at the same time, this can happen with the husband for the wife, mm. where the husband is adamant that it's time for me now to move on. But there is a, a sense, where is she? Where's the laughs we used to have? Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, we may have had moments where we're laughing, moments she's nagging, I'm nagging, I'm tired, I'm lazy. But I still now appreciate the fact that I may never get anyone like her again. And so in that at the period, there is a possibility of reconciliation. reconciliation yes. Many parents, sadly, do not encourage their sons and daughters to rethink mm -hmm. the divorce in the Idda period. Right, right. That's possibly why the Quran stressed that, listen, even if you've divorced your wife, you keep her in your house, you keep maintaining her for that uh, period of the Idda. You could change your mind. You could change your mind and maybe you too. There are some out there, by the way, who yeah. sexually, they have no problems with one another. But for example, when it came to living together in terms of, for example, the intellectual level, the religious level, mm -hmm. they felt there was disparities. Yes, yes. Um, and they still remain amicable. But then you find that there are others who go through that Idda period and decide that, listen, Idda period's finished and I'm still adamant on my decision. Yes. And then that person or that couple are both able to move on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, viewers, just to put um, things into perspective and context, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani last week and prior to that as well mentioned about the factors of idda, the observance of it, separation, the positive sides to separation. We had also a question by a sister asking, well, can she actually um, divorce someone because her husband, you know, is not practicing? And I think, you know, Dr. Um, Sayyid Amar Nakshwani has, you know, beautifully and eloquently put that together. Um, so we're looking to really put everything in sync now today as well, you know, to really summarize everything going on. So Dr. Sayyid Amar, um, Hamida from Sudan, which is a, a, an interesting text message. Mm. She wants to get married to her brother in a community. She's been divorced for five months. Um, but... She, she's, she's, she's a little bit wary of what people might think about her, as it were. Um, it's, you know, what sort of, is she going to be looked upon as being, well, she's cold, she, look at her, she's mm, just mm, moved mm, on interesting. quickly. Yep. What, what do you have to say about that, as it were? Well, know? firstly, salams to all the viewers from the, the Sudan, Sudan, you know, many great lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, uh, in Sudan. With someone like Hamida's situation, mm -hmm. Uh, firstly, it works both ways. Number one, if you found somebody who you want to get married to a few months after your divorce, yeah. five months. Five months, case. she's saying. Yes. Uh, she's completed her Adda period. Yes. There is somebody in the community. Maybe and there are some who want to move on quickly. Mm. There are some who want to get married straight away or yeah. will tell people that, listen, I'm, I'm ready to I'm move ready. on. I'm ready yes. to get married. Yeah. Just because I may have had a very difficult relationship or I may have been with someone who we just didn't click does mm -hmm. not mean that I don't want to move, move on. on. And our community should not be judging somebody yeah. in the situation because, you know, the easiest judgment that one can make is that, well, you know what? She probably has had her eyes on this person uh, for months and that's how they got married. Yes. But the community, you could not judge. And no. ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners. Right. We should think good of our fellow Muslim brethren. Absolutely. absolutely. And so if, I, if you hear that Hamida, who got divorced a number of months ago, has now moved on, that's between Hamida, her husband, and the Lord. Yes, yes. It's sad. And the Quran kept on stressing this to the nascent Muslim community morally. Okay. When it started to give us the verses in Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah 49 mm -hmm. of the Quran, mm -hmm. 
such as يا أيها الذين آمنوا اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن إن بعض الظن يث أو you believe avoid suspicion for suspicion in some cases can be a sin sin a person may and I don't blame Hamida because Hamida is probably thinking I'm going to move on because I'm moving on so quickly the community is going to say how could she just move on so quickly from her marriage mm -hmm. she that marriage may have been dead years ago. There are different types of marriages. There are some which break up and there are really regrets. Right, right. Both sides regret, but the circumstances do not help. There are other types of marriages where the people had died 10, 15 years ago. Okay. They were together because of the kids, for example. Right. Or, or publicly they had to show that there are some families who will come out publicly and say, we never divorce. We've never ever had a divorce. In our family, yes. Yeah, but yeah. buddy, you saying you've never had a divorce in your family does not mean that divorce A isn't allowed or that B, divorce doesn't happen. Yeah. Or that divorce may not be right in a certain situation. So there are fat marriages out there which are dead. Yes. So that person who may move on, they deserve to find happiness. They deserve to be around someone who they can actually enjoy their life with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there are certain uh, sisters out there, for example, they want to be in a, um, in, a, in a marriage where they can enjoy, you know, certain sports with their partner, partner. Um, want to go out to certain places with their partner, holiday with their partner, and, and so dine, on. And dine, as you mentioned. And dine, for example, and so on. As you mentioned, you know. And they may not have had yeah. that in their yeah. marriage. <laughs> now, when they get divorced, there's this assumption that, well, you've got divorced now, so you should stay away from marriage or take time out. No, if a person decides that straight away I want to get married and there's someone suitable, then why not? Yes. Yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, Sister Faiza, she's a convert from China. Um, she's texted in saying, my ex will not stop harassing me or searching, or he keeps searching my private life since we've divorced. He's even threatened to hurt any future partner. Um, what do you advise? Um, given the fact that there may be some sort of level of sensitivity that she's trying to exercise um, because of kids involved as well. I, I don't think any post-divorce period was ever gonna, going to be easy. Right. You are always going to have the possibility that you may be involved with someone uh -huh. who's still bitter about what's happened. Okay. Bitter, I don't know what this context is. Mm. But that person may still be bitter that... Um, you know, why did we get divorced? Why have you divorced me? And cannot take seeing you, for example, moving on, moving on, on or even, even in, in states of happiness. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes those who are the happiest on social media are actually the ones who are the most hurt. Right. But they, they may display a sense of happiness because it gives them some sort of solace. Yeah. And maybe, um, uh, and maybe it can be used as a shield. Right. For, for people out there who keep asking them, are you okay, are you okay? But I think in this situation, it, it, it has happened. There are certain mm. people who will stalk you. Yeah. Now forget anything, they'll stalk you. They don't want you to go anywhere. Okay. And when this person is threatening, the reality is someone has to get involved. Right. Okay. And we don't want to resort to police interference straight away. Okay. Although a threat is something to be taken seriously, seriously when someone says, yeah. listen, I'm going to come and beat whoever you're going out with because it could just be a case that someone's family member or relative has come home and this person assumes that you're in a relationship yes. with them and could end up being violent. True. So I think if one is still in contact with their ex's family mm -hmm. or knows somebody who's a good friend, to have a word and to say that, look, Firstly, Islamically, this is not moral. Okay. Rationally speaking, the masses, you know, will never accept such behavior. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, it's interesting how sometimes there are depictions of this in film, in, in, in Arabic films, Bollywood, Hollywood. Truth, You'll see truth. depictions of this where truth. there are people who cannot take the fact that they were with somebody who has moved on. Yeah. I think this period requires patience and also consultation of the people of wisdom to try and interfere okay. and to have a word. Okay. A word has to be that. had because if this person, right. I know some will say, well, it's better that I just don't do anything. Yeah, but then this yeah, person will yeah. always feel that, look, no one can mess with me or no one can talk to me. Sometimes a person has to get involved and have a polite word to say that, look, Sharia wise, this is now ended. Yeah. You may have not been happy. Trust your Lord and don't keep this level of harassment yeah. continuing. Okay, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Thank the Quran you. says, Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wala tajassasu. Right. And do not spy on one another. Mm -hmm.
If this person truly is interfering into someone's private life, spying on their lives, looking through the window, seeing what's happening, who's moving in, who's moving out, this is again far away from the morals espoused by the yeah. religion. Okay, okay, alhamdulillah, thank you for that, Sayyid. No. Um, we've got a text message from uh, Sophie by um, WhatsApp. She's um, texted from um, Sweden. So viewers do keep up the ratings and you know do call in. Um, so now her question is that um, she's divorced. Uh, she has two young boys. Their dad doesn't ever want to see them now. Um, what do I explain to them? Is her question. Um, they ask about their friends' fathers, and why is it that the the real father is showing no interest in uh, meeting them? As if it's almost like her faults. Um, so what, what can we advise on this, as it were, you know, I mean... This is probably the most difficult situation. Okay. When a divorce has happened, the one side is extremely bitter. Right. And takes the level of anger to, to an even extreme. saying, I never want to see my sons again, as in yeah. this, this story. It yes. breaks the heart. Yeah. Because Islamically, he still has to maintain... There's a period of, of maintenance for mm -hmm. the wife and that. Okay, let's say that period is, is done. Okay. And then after that, he has to still maintain those children of his. And the different schools of Islam give different opinions. Okay, okay. About... Length, as it were. Yeah, as in some will say, for example, your daughter you have to maintain until marriage, uh, whereas your sons you maintain until adolescence. Right. You know, so you're the guardian of your daughter. Until she gets married, you still have to maintain her, whereas with your sons. So there are different opinions that have been posited legally across the board in the Islamic schools. But a person, it's their responsibility to maintain. Okay, you're not going to necessarily be living with your wife. Mm -hmm. You're unhappy that your wife divorced you, yes, and that the kids, for example, are with her, that doesn't mean that your Islamic responsibilities are to be thrown out the window. No, no, not at all. Um, now, this lady, what does she explain? And that is extremely difficult to, you know, she's got Children, these sons, for two, example. Two boys. And when she's got these sons, and she has to sit with them. Now, the earlier years may be easy, but there will come a time. Yeah where these younger ones are going to be asking that, look, all my friends have got their dads coming to pick them up from school. Where's, where's dad? Yeah. You know, what happened with dad? Sure. And it's going to be a difficult situation, and it can either be addressed by the mother herself, or it can be addressed, for example, by an, a, a close family member. Okay. But most often it's going to have to be on the mother's on shoulders the to explain. Yeah, I mean, it's quite common in the Western society, you know, lots of children have grown up and are growing up knowing, mm. without knowing their fathers, as it were. Mm. So it seems like this is maybe now moving into some Islamic circles, perhaps, you know. And Yeah, it, it, it rarely happens. But when yeah. it does happen, for a lady to have her sons or son and daughter, for example, or daughters, mm -hmm. and not have the ex maintain any contact and not have the ex even try and call on a birthday at least. Right. Just on a birthday. You see, it could also work vice versa, and this is the problem sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It could also be that the mother can instill a certain even hate towards the husband as well, in the way that the kids will perceive the father. <clears throat> now, so you've got two sides. You've got yeah. that father who's negligent. Yeah. And that is the predominant case. True. But then you've also got sometimes, sometimes those mothers who had their chance to allow the kids to have a relationship with the ex. But because that ex did not treat me the way I deserve to be treated... Therefore, I'm going to take out my venom on that. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And, and this, is, this, is, this is something heartbreaking, yeah. you know. Um, that resentment, that animosity is now actually taken out on the children. Exactly. And so, they're suffering. Um, you know, the, the children in many cases don't know what's happened. No. We're not talking in the teens. Let's say the younger ones don't, don't, don't know what's happened. There may still be the odd baba, mama at that young age. 
don't let what's happened between you two cloud the possibility of an interaction. Mm -hmm. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, muqallib al qulub yeah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who rotates the hearts. Heart. Our hearts are constantly rotating. Sometimes your softness, not for the person, your ex, but rather because you want them to maintain some sort of relationship. Now some might turn around and say, do you know my ex was a this, my ex was a that. Okay, no problem. Even the worst of people, when it comes to the kids, softens. Yes. There's gangsters out there. Gangsters. But with their kids, you see him dot on the kids in a way this guy... Like teddy bear. Like teddy bear. <laughs> so both sides have a responsibility. True, <clears throat> true. But as for the father, the father figure maintenance-wise, that kid until adolescence at the very least, mm -hmm. there is a certain expectation of spending on those children. Am I correct in saying that one who refrains, as it were, from seeing his or even her children is actually causing a form of dhulm, uh, uh, an oppression. As yes, well. yes. It's, a, it's definitely an oppression. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of people are just, I think, just don't see it like that. The Quran they see tells it as freedom. us that our children yeah. are the zina of this world. Yeah, goodness. But our children are also a fitna. Zina, right. fitna. If I'm not mistaken, so if you're looking in surahs of the Quran, surah al-Kahf and surah al-Taghabun. Okay. One is saying that your kids are a zina for you, a source of pride for you. Right. Possibly a source of intercession for you. Sure. Likewise, they're going to be a trial from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I gave you wealth, I gave you health, I gave you education, I gave you family. Those kids, you couldn't call to say happy birthday? Yeah. yeah. Those kids, you couldn't just make an effort to say that, you know what, I want to take them out. For example, on the day of Eid. Mm -hmm. And I want, I want both sides to listen as well. Because sometimes the in-laws can cause even more difficulty. Yes. So you may have this one, for example, the wife. She may be very ready. And then she may have, for example, her dad or mom telling her, don't let him see her yeah, them. Yeah, yes. Don't let him get near them. Okay, hold on a minute. I'm sorry, who's got married? Why, why are you the one who's now giving the advice? You know, it's only recently someone said to me that... They, they have a, a daughter-in-law and, and the daughter-in-law, of course, married the son and they're a few years into the relationship, but she's not happy with the way the daughter-in-law dresses. You're not happy. It's not your marriage. It's not marriage yeah. Sorry, why are you getting involved? It's not your marriage. Yeah. yeah. Your son-in-law chose her. Likewise, when your daughter and your old son-in-law, when it comes to the kids, don't start making things difficult. Mm hmm it's not your marriage. It's not your marriage. Your daughter-in-law may end up being pressured. So there's a number of scenarios that emerge. Yeah, yeah. Not just the negligence of those fathers, and there are a number of them, who, who when they lock off, they lock off. It's as if those kids did not exist in their life. And years later, they regret. And yes. I, alhamdulillah, God has blessed me that I've been able to reconcile fathers with sons on a number of occasions, with God's blessings. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the, the best feelings I've ever had in my life when I've been able to speak to a father, speak to their son, who haven't spoken, in some cases, for 20 years. I remember one case, six years. Other cases, nine years. And when that reconciliation has come, that father regretted. But that father will always have a point as well that there was a moment when it could have been done, but you were adamant. I'm talking of those who the divorce went through. But sadly, there are even those out there who didn't even let a divorce go through and never saw their kids again. Can you imagine there are those out there who sadly been so unjust to their wife, they tell them, I'm not going to give you a divorce. And nor am I interested in seeing those kids that you have at home. So she's not divorced, seen as a muallaqa. Yes, yes. And she's got to be around her kids. Explain to them where this dad went. Yeah. Cash 22. It's an extremely difficult scenario. Yeah. And your heart breaks for those who had to go through that scenario. Allahu Akbar. Okay, um, Sayyidina, um, we have um, the next question from Shaheen in France. Um, her WhatsApp question reads... Um, it's hard after a divorce to stay with my parents. So she's divorced. 
Um, it's hard now to stay with my parents, but they will not let me become independent again, um, thinking that she's almost like she's 16 again. Um, do you advise leaving home um, and getting one's own place? Um, possibly, possibly. The parents are embarrassed or ashamed, wrongly so, because of their daughter's divorce. So what advice uh, can you give, Dr? First, first months after a divorce, you've got to appreciate that your breakup has a profound effect on the people who raised you. Yeah. That has to be appreciated. Okay. I said I'm... I'm I made the point earlier clear that, you know, the in-laws don't have to interfere even after divorce, but you have to be sensitive to the fact that every time they've seen you down, yes. they see you hurt, they see you cry, they prefer to see you uh, crying next to them rather than knowing that you're somewhere else alone. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, I don't care who it is, loneliness can destroy a human being. Yes, yes. Can yes. destroy them in a number of ways. There are some who've gone through very dark places because of loneliness. There are some who have no one to reach out to. You know, sometimes after a divorce, if your parents are saying, listen, stay at home, you may be thinking, well, I used to have be independent, go out anytime I want with, you know, my friends and so on. And now, now my dad's adamant that I should be there. You haven't completely lost your independence, let's mm. be clear. Right. All you've got is your parents whose heart broke for you. Yes, yes. And that's what we're trying to build. An understanding that lower the wings of mercy for your parents in these moments. Okay. You're going to get that independence back anyway. But when your mom and dad are turning around to you and saying, listen, we'll help you with the kids, we'll help you with the, <coughs> with the, the school run, we'll exactly. help you with yeah. all of this, they're, they're telling you because their heart bleeds for you. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes that patience is required with our elders. Okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you for that advice. Um, there's a sister, she's given a name, uh, Rahima, as uh, alias intentionally. Um, she's divorced and wishes to know, um, can she do muda without her parents' permission? So she's divorced and she wants to know, can she do muda? without her parents' permission? That's the first part, and there's a second part coming up after that. Well, the first part, the answer is that if the marriage has been consummated, okay. then she can do her muta without her parents' permission. And what if she's divorced, but she did not, there was, not, there's, there was no consummation of the marriage? If there's no consummation, differences of opinion. Okay. Ayatollah okay. Sistani maintains the opinion about asking for parents, um, you know, asking for the father's approval as okay. the guardian. Whereas you have, for example, someone like um, Ayatollah Sadiq Rouhani, who's quite open to the fact that even if there was no consummation, you can independently make that on. decision. What they all agree on is if you're living an independent life where you don't rely on your parents for anything monetarily and so on, then you okay. can m make your own decision. Right, okay. I'm but the really... preference is towards the guardian. Okay. Um... There's another sister here, and it's, um, this caller, she's actually texted in from Germany. So, you know, um, a brother approached me for Modar while knowing that I am divorced. So, you know, she, people have known that she's obviously divorced. Um, is it not shameful that we have to resort to this? What does the Ahle Sunnah mother, or school of thought, um, why does not the Ahlul Sunnah mother not allow this, but we Shia uh, allow this so easily? Um, so what is the... Well, a, a person who's divorced is independent. Mm. The whole idea of the approach being easier is because of the fact that when a marriage has been consummated, you are no longer in need of the guardian's approval for who you have a relationship with. with. As long as you're looking after the laws which have been prescribed for you okay. and following them. Right. That person approaches you, you're entirely you know, free to say yes or to say no. Okay, okay. Well, it's like any marriage. Yeah, any, but in, someone... in, in, her, in her mind, she clearly thinks that this is probably a form of degradation or why are we resorting to this? I don't, I don't know why it's a form of degradation. If, if, if someone thinks you're, you know, you're quite attractive, attractive. that they want to 
to yeah. be involved in a relationship with you. I don't know why it's degradation. And if you, if you yourself don't agree mm. with that particular lifestyle and you don't want to follow it, then don't follow it. Yeah. Um, Ahl al-Sunnah do not permit because there is a recognition or a belief, a belief that um, the temporary marriage was prohibited. Now, whether it was prohibited in the time of the Prophet or prohibited uh, by the second caliph, that can be debated on another occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, these are different legal opinions of different schools in, in the religion. However, they may have other forms of marriages, such as the Orfi or the Nisyar, Mm -hmm. um, which talk of maybe, for example, engaging in a relationship when traveling or engaging in a, in a relationship, but not necessarily fixed term. So within Shia law, if you're a divorcee, right. say there is a sister, now she's divorced. Okay. She was involved in a relationship. She may have a, one child, for example, from that relationship. She can be involved in a relationship at any time. Right. There is no obstacle. There's no need for father's permission. There's no need for... Maulana, there's no need for witnesses, there's no need for anything of that. Okay. What there is a need for is for one to agree a time period that they mm -hmm. are together and to give a dowry. Right. And once that's done, now, something important here. Bismillah. While on the technical level, this is something which is permissible within the religion of Islam in terms of the Ja'fari school, there is no doubt that there is emotional attachments, irrespective of those who say there won't be. Okay. What I mean by that is, when someone is going to do temporary marriage, you're a divorcee and you want to do a temporary marriage, you were in a relationship for 10, 12 years with the same person, and now you want to move on, and you want to engage in temporary marriage. There has to be a recognition that, as long as everything's done in halal, uh -huh. it's entirely up to you what you want to do, but... Doing something in halal doesn't hide the fact that emotionally the person you are with may not be the one you're going to be with forever. Right. That person, you, you may assume yeah. that the person that I'm with could be the one. And it could be the one. Because what other way are you going to get to know each other without it being um, haram? You know? yes. I mean, otherwise, yeah, you're yeah. going to have to go into a world of, um, of that which is prohibited. So now, when, when we're looking at this method... There are many out there who, for example, will engage in the temporary marriage mm -hmm. with somebody who is divorced. Okay. They might both be divorced for that matter. And if they're both divorced and they engage in a temporary marriage, during that period of the temporary marriage, they may want to see whether there is that attraction, whether there is uh, that click. Yeah, yep. But let no one be fooled okay. that there isn't, for example... A case where men will enter temporary marriages without any emotional feeling whatsoever, mm. purely physical. Because yeah. if you remember the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, when they first talked to him about the temporary marriage, they're saying, do we castrate ourselves? And then he says, no, engage in a temporary marriage for three days, for example, yeah. let's say. Yes. So then there is a reality that some divorced ladies imagine that when this person I'm doing a temporary marriage with, when this person is with me, that means they're going to do over me. They're going to keep calling me. They're going to be, you know, crazy about me. No. You may actually realize your ex-husband did more of that than this person. Yeah. This yeah. person may not be interested in marriage. There was a, there was a quote once that, uh, so a lady says, I want to marry a guy with a six-pack. And, mm -hmm. and then someone said, well, there's a reason those guys are not married. You know, uh, they don't want to settle down because they... They don't want attachment. They don't want attachment. They're looking all right. And, they and so on. So, so some live in this assumption that, you know what, when I get divorced, the grass is green on the other mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Some deserve to see that grass because yeah, they've yeah, been absolutely. in the worst relationships, by sure. the way. And anything can be greener. Um, but then there are others who imagine, well, you know what, I can be with any guy now. And then when you are with somebody, it could be two situations. It could be with someone who you both agree that, look, we know we're not going to get, we're not going to, for example, live together forever, but we enjoy each other's company. One has needs, the other has needs, and you want to be together. But for a lady to understand this can sometimes be extremely difficult. You see, if we're talking even in the West, there are certain shows 
on television that mm -hmm. talked about how divorced women would prowl the streets of New York, for example. Okay. Or prowl the streets of London, for example. Right. And they'd be with younger guys, and they'd be with good-looking guys, and their heart will still break. And those guys will still move on, and those yeah. guys will still not be able to commit. So some have the assumption, which can be false, that I'm divorced, I can be with anyone, there, there is a good chance that emotionally the man doesn't have any. And for men to lock off, lock off their emotions, something extremely normal. Yeah. You know, it's not, not surprising whatsoever that men are able to just shut down and just have purely sexual relationships. But for that lady who may have been on the backdrop of a difficult marriage, for her to see that again may make her think twice about whether she wants to engage in a temporary relationship. Right, yeah. right. Where's the wisdom they say now? Um, moving now to Australia. Um, Razia, she's a divorcee. And she wants to ask, um, can she do muda with non-Muslims or non-Muslim? Marriage. A Muslim female cannot marry a non-Muslim. And when we say this, I say this with some difficulty because there are non-Muslims out there who are better than us. Let's be frank. Okay. In some cases more trustworthy, in some cases less envious, uh, in some cases softer hearts. So I don't want to demean another religion or their beliefs. Mm. When we say that a Muslim woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man, it's normally recognized that the man is seen as the head of the household, the leader of the household, the one the kids will be affected by, one's beliefs may be affected by. Now, I'm not going to say that's everywhere because Europe and America can shatter that sometimes. Okay. I think generally in the world today, if you're still looking at Africa, South America, the Middle East, they're still with that type of worldview. Now, that lady, therefore, she can definitely get to know somebody. Okay. Who, let's say she meets somebody at work. Now, she's a divorcee. Mm -hmm. She meets this person at work and he says, I'm Christian. And she wants to show him the path as he works. So. Yeah. And she wants to explain the religion of Islam. That person converts, for example, towards the religion. There is no harm in them engaging in the mutah. Right. There is no harm in them getting married. If he has converted. If he has converted. Now, some will say, you know, they only convert because they want to do the nikah. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll get your token revert who comes for a nikah at the mosque. And in some cases, he doesn't have a clue about the religion of Islam. But he's... He's listen, besotted by the I'm religion. besotted by this yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are which cases. words do you want me to say in Arabic? So we tell him the words. The guy does the nikah. After that day, he hasn't got a clue what's going on in the faith. Probably he's... In some cases, his missus isn't even the most religious person in the world. Yeah. And therefore, he's not really going to be inspired if his own missus is yes. miles away. Yes. Uh, but still, we cannot judge. No, no. If that person has recited the kalima, the shahada, the words, the formula mm -hmm. for entering or submission to the path of Islam, then that person has you know, joined the social milieu of the religion. Yeah. yeah. He is part of the Muslim community. And it's not for any of us to make a judgment. Right. Let's be clear. Okay. But for that divorcee lady of the Muslim community to be involved in a mut'a with her, and you know, I've, I received many messages on this. Can I be in a mut'a with a non-Muslim? Can I be in a mut'a with a non-Muslim? And, and sometimes people are blatant in their messages. Is there a loophole to be in a mut'a with a non-Muslim? I'm sad, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's no loophole. Uh, if there was a loophole, I would tell you, but there is no loophole. Um, Islam is adamant that um, marriage for the female with the non-Muslim is something not allowed. Okay, yeah. so uh, uh, viewers, um, we're going to just be going into a short break. Um, please do call uh, for questions, uh, 203 515 You can also WhatsApp your questions, 07939-917163. Also, if you can, kindly donate to the channel Imam Hussein TV. Imam Hussein TV can only put productions and TV content and have such prolific guests such as Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani with your help. So please do gen donate generously, inshallah. So see you soon. Salam.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to tonight's live show, Islamic Divorce Part 3. Um, Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakhshwani, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as And um, just going back now to a number of questions. So the next question that we have is, um, where does one go for matchmaking uh, when divorced with children? It's near impossible. Um, I suppose, Sayyid, now this is applicable for both men and women. Um, what barriers are there if a divorced man or woman wishes to ask for more personal questions without offending the potential suitor? So the first part is, um, you know, where does one go for matchmaking? I think there's good, A, either mm -hmm. organizations in our mosques. Okay. Or that there are people who are members of the community who are brilliant at bringing people together. Right. It's not going to be easy. No one said that post-divorce things were going to be easy. Sadly, sure. this is... One of the rules of life, mm -hmm. that after a person has been involved in divorce, their fault, not their fault, right. there's always going to be a question as to why that relationship, for example, broke. And, and I always stress that don't be despondent. Okay. Whatever you do, don't despair of the mercy. Someone says, what's the difference between despondency and despair? One is you begin to tell everybody, I will never get married. No one's going to accept me. And another one, you have it in your heart, but you don't tell anyone. Yeah, yeah. There are two types. There are some who, for example, have it in their heart that, you know what, I don't think th this man, for example, will ever come. Or I don't think I'll find the right person. Mm -hmm. There are others who will say openly that I'm never, ever going to find this right person. Don't despair. and Don't be despondent. Right. There are some who went through terrible divorces. Okay. Difficult divorces. Three kids, four kids. And then within a matter of a year, they found someone who was happy to be with them and their kids. Okay. Who was happy to build a relationship with them. Yes. Because they recognized that they had a special person who maybe someone else did not show the appreciation to that that person, for example, should have deserved. If you have that trust. Yes. Whoever is conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's presence in their life. He will open for them doors door. mm. and provide them with sustenance, an amount that you cannot imagine, that you cannot count, that you cannot even tell the secrets of where it's come from. You see, if there are, for example, some out there who feel that since their divorce is difficult for them to get married, there is a dua, a supplication okay. for rizq, yes. which we recite after Salat al-Isha. Okay. And this supplication, when I say supplication for rizq, for many people, the moment they hear rizq, they straight away think it means money. Mm. May Allah increase your rizq. Yes. Okay, money. Yeah. Dollars, pounds, euros. What many don't realize is that sometimes the greatest rizq you could have is health. Sometimes the parents, good friends. Wisdom, knowledge. Wisdom, knowledge. Ma'raf of Ahl al-Bayt These are the greatest forms of rizq, but also finding somebody who becomes a backbone for you in your life. Yeah, yeah. In that dua after Salat al-Asha, I recommend everybody. Okay. Married, not married, divorced, whatever. Recite that dua every day after Salat al-Asha. Allahumma innahu laysa li almu bi mawdai rizqi wa innama atlubuhu bi khataratin takhtaru ala qalbi. فأجول في طلبه البلدان فأنا فيما أنا طالب كالحيران لا أدري أفي سهل هو أم في جبل أم في أرض أم في سماء أم في بر أم في بحر وعلى يدي من ومن قبل من وقد علمت أن علمه عندك and so on this this one supplication is when a person acknowledges I don't know where that sustenance lies whether it's financial whether it's a future partner who I can see some of my dreams with but one thing I know is with you, Ya Allah. It could be somewhere in the sea. Yes. In the skies. It could be on the earth. It could be, you know, uh, in public, in private. I don't know where, where my rizq lies. I'm not sure. But one thing I know, oh God, you're the one who know, can make it easy for me. Hmm. Alhamdulillah. When you face this situation and you're like the community does not make it easy for us. Where am I going to get married if I'm divorced and I have a couple of kids? 
And it's sad the injustice is done to certain ladies where people presume because they're divorced that they're the worst human being in the world. In many cases, they are a pleasure to be with, yes. a joy to be with, yes. a yes. wonderful human being, a soft-hearted person, but who just, wrong end of the stick, bad, you know, bad situation, trial, you know, in some cases from their Lord, as the, there are prophets and imams who face trials in their marriages. Um, but also at the same time, I, I got to be frank about this. Okay. If, if you're comfortable being independent at the moment, then be frank about that. Okay. So maybe you're enjoying your independence, not having a guy around. Maybe. Yeah. Be yeah. frank about that. Yeah. Don't let your mom and dad force you that you know what, you're not married yet, and you there have to. If you're enjoying the independence, don't bring someone into your life, but you're loving the independence. Then, number two. The question was asked about what questions do we ask someone? Mm. Without being imposing, as it yeah, were. Yeah. You know, because I'm sure people instinctively assume, and rightly so, that mm, mm. they don't want to get stung again. And they want to do their homework. And oh, there's a chance you'll get stung again. They, they, <laughs> no, let's, let's, let's be frank about this. There's a chance that we will be stung again. And I don't, I don't understand why everybody will assume that because you've had a breakup, you can't be stung again. Mm -hmm. We don't know how the system of trials works. You know, there are some of us who have been involved in relationships um, and a relationship breaks and you regret it. And then you'll find somebody special in your life who you absolutely love being around. There are others out there who assume that, you know what, let me ask a hundred questions because I've been burnt. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, because I've been burnt, I can't blame them. Psychologically, that burning remains. Mm. I was in an abusive relationship. I was in a relationship emotional abuse, not just physical. Yes. Where I was constantly put down. And therefore, the first time that I'm put down by somebody else, it reminds me of that. Yes, yes. Uh, but they could be even two completely different human beings. There's a put down from somebody who's arrogant. There's a put down from somebody who loves you but cares for you. Mm, yes. You know, so, yeah, yeah. so one of the biggest problems as well is when you want to move on, but it's, you're unfair to the person who you're trying to meet because you're judging them by the barometer either of the previous one or by the failures of the previous yeah, one. Yeah, true. Very well said. Yes. So there are divorcees who had great chances to, to move on and have a great relationship with somebody else. But when they've wanted that more, when they've had that chance, they compare. Yeah, sure. Yes, then you've got to completely different people. Okay, yep. so now moving to the next question. The viewers, um, um, Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani beautifully and very eloquently recited that uh, dua, as it were, after Salat Isha. Prior to that, he mentioned verse 2 and 3 of Surah Talaq, the divorce, which is in itself a great dhikr. Um, so, Dr. Sayyid Amar, we have um, a question here. Assalamu alaikum, dear Sayyid. I have been divorced now for over a year and I have three children who are balik. Uh, my teenage kids do not wish to visit their father as he often tries to manipulate them against me, lies and threatens them. My question is, what rights do they have? Um, does their father still have to provide for them if they choose not to visit him but still respect him? So it's a really good question. He has told them if they don't obey him or are obedient to him, that he no longer has to provide for them. So there's emotional blackmail, perhaps, uh, coercement, a number of different factors in this. Uh, I think these situations, difficult. these situations, a the ego of the wife and the ex-husband, the, the ego has to mm -hmm. be shot down. Okay. You know, these kids do not deserve to be so confused. Right. And so agitated at that young age. Okay. It's very sad when we hear stories like this. Okay. You, I'll manipulate that child against her. She'll manipulate that son against me. Mm -hmm. This is not the ethics of the religion of Islam. Okay. And we have to keep on stressing the line, this is not the ethics of the religion of Islam, because either we're Muslim or, as the Quran says, that there were a group of people called the Arab who just didn't care about what Islam had bought when it came to their own laws and their own customs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the tribal Bedouin Arab. Right. Now, in this situation, the father has to maintain those kids. Mm -hmm. And 
the kids have a duty to show obedience towards their parents. Right. Um, the father has a duty to maintain them. Okay. And somebody has to come towards an amicable uh, agreement. It, right. can, it will not be reconciled between the father and the ex-wife, for example, and his ex-wife, because mm -hmm. they already have a bitterness towards one another. Yeah, yeah. But there is still a need to maintain the relationship from both sides. Okay, okay. From both sides. Now, this father, unless he's somebody who's blasphemed Allah and the Prophet, mm -hmm. and is someone who's cursed God and, you know, hates the religion, doesn't want to be near the that's a different story. Right, right. You have somebody who you have a, a difference of opinion with the way you lived your life. Yes. There should still be some sort of communication. So, should there be some sort of mediation? Because yeah, there has in, to his, be mediation. in his mind, he may think, you know what? I'm going to play on that verse. Don't say off to me. Yeah. And there are people like that. Yeah. And therefore, it's a form of almost blackmailing someone. So Each situation when it comes to a divorce and children is different. Right. And that's why when it comes to child custody. Yeah in Islamic law after a divorce. In the past, for example, there used to be the classic opinion that if you divorce, the kids go with the mother up until the age of two right. for the boy, up until the age of seven for the girl. Then there was the opinion of, no, at the age of two, both the boy and the girl leave the mom and go back to the father okay then you hear of an opinion both when they're seven the boy and the girl mm -hmm. are to go back where to the father father after the age of seven and in lebanon this caused difficulties and issues right. because you know lebanon has got a wonderful diverse plurality of of schools of islam living together mm. in faith and interfaith Okay. And you've got the, you know, the Ja'fari school, which is represented in Lebanon as well. And you've sure. got the Sharia court and so on right. for the Ja'fari madhab. And there were a number of divorcees who were adamant that why is it that in Shia law, child custody, I'm a divorcee. My two-year-old has to go to that ex-husband of mine if it's a boy. And the seven-year-old girl has to, for example... Go towards my husband. Why? I'm a mom. Yeah. These are yeah. my heart walking outside my body. Mm. What are children? Mm -hmm. The heart of a human mm. walking outside their body. Yeah. Yeah. And no doubt. what you found is the question arises. Why is it, for example, some of our great Maraja said that when you are divorced, the mother can keep the child, which is a boy, until two and the daughter until two, or two and seven, or seven and seven. Or some even said she, the children stay with the mom okay. until the mom gets married. Right. So look at the varying opinions we have okay. about right. custody of the child right. in Shia law. Why is this the case? Because each case is different. Okay, okay. You see... If but, would, but Sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah. But would they, that, each case is different, and I agree with that. No, I'm not disputing that at all. But surely, going back to something that we discussed in show one and maybe even two, the living standards of where one resides, does that play a factor? So, for example, if one is living in Najaf, Bahrain, Om, and then living here, one or two people, one, one person, one of the spouse members may disagree with them. To hell with that. I'm not having that. I'm not going to give my child away, as it were, you know, according to what happened. So do you think that has also... Because uh, I think that also psychologically... Well, one of the major clashes that you have is yeah. that you can use the legal system of a non-Muslim country. Uh, absolutely. And I think there are many out there yeah. who will go towards the legal system of a non-Muslim country, knowing that, listen, in many cases in the, in the non-Muslim mm. legal system, the woman will have the greater... Yes. ...the rights. Right. Um, now... Morally resorting to the non-Muslim legal system on such issues when you could have resolved them amicably with the Muslim community. Some will say, which amicably? Our Maulanas won't listen to a word that mm. we say. Others say that the Maulana knows his family. He's no way going to be, for example, looking after us. But my main point is child custody 
after a divorce is not restricted to one particular classic opinion. Right, right. But rather, Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq, they would have had looked at each case in its context. Okay. okay. Contextually, that father is arrogant, drunkard, etc., etc. This is the answer. Contextually, that person is not a bad person. You two don't get on, but the kids shouldn't go through this. Yeah. Okay. So, so everything is contextual. Right. So now, if we have a divorcee out there, and she has a two-year-old boy mm -hmm. and a seven-year-old girl, and Maulana has turned around, for example, and said that the opinion is two years, that boy goes to the dad. That is not the set opinion. Mm. There have been opinions where this the idea was that the, the kids stay with the mom until the mom remarries. Marries. Now, Shia law, generally, you'll find an opinion that when the mom remarries, the kids go to the father. Okay, okay. Now, this is not necessarily something which has to be in every case yeah. because you've still got cases where fathers can be extremely difficult um, or even far away from religion. Now, you're going to put these kids in their house. Yeah. The kids can be affected. Okay. But we know very well that when it comes to the age of maturity, from that age onwards, they can make their own decision Decisions, or make yes. their point clear. Yeah. Before that, the husband has to make sure that he protects them and looks okay, like alhamdulillah. Them. So now we have a number of different questions. Uh, Salam, I have previously texted in about a problem. A problem Maulana in London. He, this weekend, sent me divorce papers dated from three months back. He has unilaterally terminated my marriage without my permission or consent and knowledge. My wife was caught having an affair and I divorced her for this reason. He has ignored the significant fact and issued a non-fault divorce. What does the Sayyid think about this practice and what can I do? What is a non-fault divorce, first of all, Sayyidna? Well, with these cases, you know, we, we really need to listen to both sides yeah, before we yeah. begin to put judgments and then we gave this opinion. Because divorce for a Mawlana can be a nightmare. Yeah. Because divorce for a Mawlana, if you give an opinion, it can mm -hmm. be a case of, for example, um, it can be a case where you've taken one side and the other, the other side is completely angry with you. If you found that there is a case where you have been oppressed, yes, then go to the office of the marja, right, where you reside. In London, for example, you'll find that maraja have got their offices. You go there and present your case. And also make clear that this person, I believe, has made a mistake in this area. Yeah. Speak to him. Check why has this happened. I think this is what needs to be done. Okay, okay. Um, Salam, question for the show. Usually when women get married, they have to leave their hometown to be with the husband and his family. Some even have to move to other countries and give up their families. Some years later, the husband divorces his wife and his family also abandons her. But due to the children, she is now stuck and faces a hostage type situation. What do you say about this oppression on women and children after divorce and a man moves on and remarries? This entering into marriage, no one said was going to be rosy. Mm -mm. And no one said people are not going to change. People change. And no one said both of you spiritually have the same level. No. There is a strong possibility that things can become sour. Yeah. I'm broken, no doubt, when I hear of how sour things can become because certain people have been treated abysmally. Mm -hmm. But there is always a way in which you can receive help. This is something that I believe we should encourage more. There are many ladies, victims of domestic abuse, yeah. emotional abuse, physical abuse. There have to be hostels and shelters in different areas that are able to cater for them when they are alone. That sister, for example, imagine your sister gets married to somebody and they live in the stick somewhere where you guys have to take a nine hour plane ride to go and visit them. Now, imagine a divorce does take place. Alhamdulillah, in many cases, you're able to, for example, at that moment say that, you know what, come home. We're booking your flight home. Yeah. But there are others who have no one. They have nobody who can help them at that moment. And we need to recognize this.
And there always have to be local mosque endeavors, programs, organizations which seek to care for those ladies. Remember in the Quran in Surah 58, right. the Arabs used to, if for example, he doesn't like his wife, he used to insult her by saying to her, you are to me like the back of my mother. A lady was insulted like that by the name of Khawla, Surah okay. 58 of the Quran. Okay. And Surah 58 of the Quran begins, قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَسْمَعْ تَحَوْرَكُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِعَ مَسْمَ Allah hears the cry of the pleading woman mm. who complains about her husband. husband. And I believe that there are many ladies out there who no doubt have been put into positions where you... you it's very difficult to win because if, for example, you've settled in a city for 15, 20 years, your kids have grown up with that language, and then all of a sudden he abandons you because he's found someone half your age, it's a difficult moment. Yeah. Because what do you do? Because the kids, what, do you relocate with the kids? Where do you now start earning from? And when Where it brings go, us to, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. the discussion about maintenance, absolutely. this is a, a, a major yeah, yeah. area. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, we have another question. While respecting Islamic boundaries within a mixed yet conservative environment, e.g. the masjid, what is the ideal way to approach or show interest in the opposite gender or potential? Well, some cases just go directly, you mm -hmm. know, in some cases go direct and say that I have an interest. As uh, Shu'aib went to Musa for his daughter. Yeah. Uh, Khadija with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. Or in other cases, get a good friend um, to maybe have a word and see if there's any possibility. Okay, yeah. okay. We'll just come back very quickly to the next uh, WhatsApp question. But before we do, we had one wait in here. Um, my ex is a drunkard. Is it true that my kids go to him when I move on? This is from Huda. Yeah, it's a difficult one because the, the assumption is that so, as soon as you're divorced, mm. as we know, for the first two years, definitely with the mom. And then, as we said earlier, that uh, if the boy, for example, gets to the age of two, some had the opinion that straight away the mom has to give it to the dad. But the dad is somebody who's a drunkard. No way somebody who's, who's the, the judge of Islamic law will accept that custody goes to somebody right. who is of that type of character. Okay, yeah. okay. Um... Um, the we've spoken about bitter divorces and children, you know, being sort of uh, having resentment, as it were. Um, we had a bitter divorce, but my ex, she has made my kids hate me. Is this acceptable? Does Islam talk about any amicability? And we've obviously spoken about that. But if you want to elaborate anything else, then we'll move on to the next question. Um, my ex badmouths me to the whole Iraqi community um, and has even exposed our bedroom secrets. What do you advise on? Oh, after a divorce, craziest things happen. And, um, and if you've had a bitter one, then don't be surprised if you're badmouthed. But one thing I always say is there's two sides to the story. Mm. Um, you know, even if you think that you are right, there is a reality that there were certain things which you did wrong. Yes. There's always two sides of the story. Mm -hmm. Now, there are going to be people who are going to hate you, whatever happens. There's going to be people who are going to badmouth you, whatever happens. If you can uh, get through the first couple of months after a divorce, you should be fine. They'll find somebody else who they'll go after, who they want to destroy. Right, right. Okay. Now, just in terms of continuing from um, maintenance, as it were, um, you've mentioned about the ages, as it were, according to various... Malaje and the offices, opinions, and so on and so forth. Um, but also what we've had is a question coming back, as it were, in terms of how long should my husband maintain me if I am unmarried? That's the question here that's come back. If I, if I remain unmarried and I have children, how long does he have to maintain? His responsibility are the kids. His responsibility in relation to you as the wife is up to the Idda period finishes. Okay, okay. There are, there are discussions in Islamic law, for example, about the husband maintaining a provision for his wife should they die. Mm -hmm. You know, should the husband die, there should be a provision maintained for a year, others say for a few months. 
But in terms of the idea of alimony, for example, within Shi'i law, yeah. it's an interesting one if someone actually writes a paper on this. You're looking at the case that, firstly, what you have is the dowry. Right. Let's look at this. So you've got this dowry which is agreed upon. And when this dowry is agreed upon, in some cases, the whole dowry will have to be paid if right. a divorce happens. If it happens without consummation, mm -hmm. then half is to be returned. The right. other half is to be kept by the, okay. by the lady. Um, and then you've got, for example, in the Idda period, food, clothing, for example, you know, the shelter, that is to be maintained in that period. After that, if, for example, let's say, Somebody contributed to the furnishings of the house. Yeah. The wife. Then that amount that was contributed, for example, the furnishings, the furnishings all go back to her. She's the one who paid for that. Right. If, for example, you two have both invested in a, there is a contract where both of you have invested for a property, then again, there is a situation where the judge of Islamic law has to sit down and see how much did your wife put in? Right. Some turn around and say, all these years that I have looked after him and all of a sudden I receive nothing from him. Sadly, sometimes that's the bitterness of divorce. There are, see, in Surah Al-Baqarah, there is the verse about maintaining the mm -hmm. wife. But that mm -hmm. normally refers to the maintenance, say there is no consummation which has occurred and there is a maintenance which has to be observed by the husband. And then you've got the scholars, some saying it's, recommended to maintain others saying there is nothing about maintenance post divorce okay really the intermediaries for maintenance are those kids yes yes absolutely those kids are the ones who you as a father still have to spend on and that wife in reality that wife is the one who's looking after those kids mm -hmm. so there has to be a, a, a conclusion which is reached now some will turn around and say, I'm not going to do the Islamic way because that doesn't get me anything. I'm going for the full 50% which the non-Muslim legal courts allow me. Yeah. I want 50% of everything. Whether someone like Imam Salih would have recommended us to seek the opinions of the non-Muslim when we could have resorted to the opinions of Islamic the jurisprudence. Islamic jurisprudence and scholars, mm -hmm. That is something, a burden that you're going to have to bear on the day of judgment. Right. That I disregarded what Islamic law said. Right. And wanted to get the law of the land. In some cases, the law of the land has to be used. Because if you've got joint mortgage accounts and you've purchased this and it's in your name and you've put this much in, then yes, there is a provision that has to be insured. Okay. But in terms of monthly payments and so on, that would normally be the agreement that the courts have come but what, to. What about, I mean, we've had a question. Is it, is it recommended that a woman or a family or guardian does not ask for high dairy, that it is her right to demand at any time? Um, just staying on this topic, I mean, we've heard recent cases of brothers who've been left with nothing, but, but at least the dairy safeguards us for the sake of the women. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's why there are people out there who will want a high dowry from the person who's come to propose for their yeah. daughter. Because okay. they're like, listen, you put something up front. Okay. You're taking this uh, commodity, mm -hmm. excuse the language commodity, but um, Islamic legal terminology, it really is. Uh, you're taking this commodity, mm -hmm. I want the deposit. Right. Now I go to a car showroom now and I want to buy a car, they're going to say to me that make sure you put down a deposit. Yeah. And likewise, when it comes to this issue, there are, this is the reality. There are people out there who will say, listen, 10,000 pounds now. Another 10,000 upon completion of divorce, for example. <laughs> or we'll return to you 5,000 if you don't consummate, for example. And, and so on and so forth. And there are some, forget 10,000, some 15,000, some 100,000, some a million. Right. There are some, and, and sometimes you look, for example, in Iraq, there are some brilliant youth who cannot get married. No. Because of the extortion diaries. Now, Imam al-Baqir talks of, you know, the worst of times being when someone asks for a high dowry. Yeah. But some are now using this to say that, wait, if I'm not going to be maintained and I'm going to be doing everything for this family, but that shouldn't be the intention when you enter that marriage. You know? Okay, okay. Look, I know things go sour. I know there are trials. 
But that should never be the intention. The intention is that, look, my Lord, I'm going to try my hardest. I hope he tries his hardest. We're going to try and make this work. Sickness, health, good times, bad. As the famous um, introduction would be if someone was in the church, for example, to yes. a marriage nikah ceremony. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Right. There are some husbands who are cheapskates. There's no doubt whatsoever. As cheap as you'll get. Mm -hmm. Who will ensure that every loophole is pulled for them not to maintain the wife and the kids. Okay. Okay. Mind you, those types of husbands, I think even if Imam Mahdi came, will not contribute to any of his campaigns. So okay. you have that type who are completely neglectful of their duty. Uh -huh. And you have to feel sorry for those ladies who not only are divorced, not only have to maintain their kids, but also have to go out and earn a living and balance all of that. Right. It can be extremely difficult. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry for um, jumping the gun, as it were. We're getting numerous WhatsApp messages, and that's why the questions are moving mm. sideways, as it were. Salam. I know someone who is divorced, separated, with children who are old enough now, between 10 and 18 years of age. They started using the mother's maiden name as their surname. As their surname, is there any ruling to this Islamically? I have heard we cannot remove our father's surname. I'm not sure if this is correct. Please clarify. Well, listen, you want to you want to use your mother's name. Yeah. There's no issue there, but there is still a biological attachment mm -hmm. um, to to your father. You know, someone gets adopted by somebody, yeah, and they can easily take the adopted name. Uh, but the reality is, they have to maintain the name of who their original parent is. So you could do that. You know, have your mother's maiden name for whatever reason. Yes, you, can, you cannot deny parentage. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, I have been married for a couple of years with no kids. My ex has cheated multiple times behind my back. He has also attempted to sexually assault my family members. Do I still need to give him, do I still need him to give me a divorce? We have been living separately for a year now. I've spoken to a sheikh and the sheikh has contacted my ex, but he says he wants a, de a legal divorce. Now my question is, legal, is legal divorce good enough or do I need to um, still get an Islamic divorce? Well, the, the sheikh who you've contacted, if he sees that you're your partner is not maintaining you, mm -hmm. whether it's physically or financially, he should um, arrange the divorce and get it done. Okay, okay. So they're really coming in fast now. Um, uh, salams, in some cases of divorced women um, who often get the right to children in the first seven years, take children away from the biological father, especially in developing countries where culturally it is difficult to force paternal rights, such as Pakistan and India. In such cases, what advice would you give such women? who are now suppressing the rights of a father and their own children. Please use, use, use the alias, Nazish. Like I said, it's very difficult when someone has been through a turbulent relationship and remembers mm -hmm. all the bad memories. But don't let those kids be destroyed because of your feelings. Right. It's not easy growing up in an environment, knowing your mom and dad were divorced, seeing your mom and dad fight, seeing bitterness. And there are a number of ladies out there who've tried their hardest to contact husbands. It very rarely is the opposite way. Mm -hmm. But if it is the opposite way, then for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Day of Judgment and for the sake of pleasing the family of the Prophet in the sense that they taught us through all trials, try and look at the bigger picture. Okay. Try and soften your heart. Okay. Okay. You know, I remember a scene in Safin, the water is with Muawiyah and he won't give a sip of it to the army of Imam Amir al muminin Yeah. But when Imam Amir al muminin has the water, mm -hmm. he cannot bear to see the animals in Muawiyah's army thirsty. Ahl al-Bayt taught us certain valuable lessons. Even though people had oppressed them, taken their rights, which many ladies feel that the ex has done. Yes. They try to find a way to build for the better. Okay, okay. And even sometimes when you feel that you're part of a community maybe that has not observed their rights with you. There was the first imam of yours who lost his rights, but when you needed advice, he was the first to stand up and help. So let's take from their examples. Yes. And, yes. and look at something a bit bigger. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It requires... A real struggle to have your kids smile with someone who hurt you so much. But 
soften your heart for those kids. Yes. Yeah. Um, so now, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have run out of time. There was a few more questions. Um, so, viewers, hopefully, inshallah, you've enjoyed this show. Um, do call in again next week and please do kindly donate to Imam Hussain TV. The telephone number again for donations is 0203 515 From Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani and myself, Muhammad Ali, Assalamu alaikum and see you again next time, inshallah. Mm -hmm.